to the to our library also to be shared with colleagues in case they're not available to join. But as I was saying, I'm I'm pleased to welcome um, the the um, Fabio and Tanya. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, they're from the Crisis Bureau, and I'm gonna uh, quickly go over. Sorry, one sec. Okay. So Fabio is a senior advisor at uh, UNDP Crisis Bureau, and Tanya is a knowledge management uh, specialist. Um, and they'll be presenting on UNDP thought leadership uh, through evidence-based um, knowledge products. Uh, also, they'll be speaking on the Development Future series um, and how to uh, work with uh, strong evidence and to present, uh, to, to showcase UNDP's work. Um, and we've had sessions so far um, on editing and design, promoting your knowledge products um, on our uh, ND. So you can, uh, in case you missed any of those, you can, uh, you're welcome to check those uh, later. We're going to be sharing the links. Um, and without further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Fabio. Um, again, with thanks uh, to all of you for joining. Um, and please feel free to uh, send messages uh, on the chat. Uh, if you want to, um, please introduce yourselves. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can be sharing them um, throughout the session. And we'll have, um, uh, hopefully, um, time to um, address them and, and have a, a discussion. So. With thanks again, uh, Fabio, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Kavini, and uh, thanks also to Nina for uh, for and the SGI for organizing this and inviting us to to present. Uh, Annie and I we're going to share uh, the presentation. Uh, we've been asked to talk about you know twenty five minutes, half an hour. We probably do a bit less because otherwise um, we know it's nine a.m. in New York, but later somewhere else and we don't want to you know clock too much your your calendar we want to you know share some something but also get some questions for you and maybe clarify uh i have a presentation i want to share um uh so let me just just let me know if you can see this i see it yeah that's great so the presentation is the outline is the following um, we'll try to really make this very practical about really what thought leadership is, especially when you're talking about UNDP, which is a development organization primarily that works also in crisis context. So the view from the crisis bureau where I sit and where I work will be part of the presentation, but we are looking at more broadly how thought leadership is exercised, etc. The second part of the presentation is looking really more at the crisis bureau, how we do that in the bureau, how we have systematized knowledge products, how we develop them based on evidence and consultation with the field. Uh, we have uh, standard operating procedures. We'll try to also you know, share some of that um, uh, that work that we're implementing. And uh, we thought also it would be great to provide an example of a UNDP thought leadership piece, which is the Development Future Series. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with it. Tani will tell you more about it. It's a series of publication that's been going on now for three years over 80 papers being published on the future of development. And uh, this is primarily really a, a thought leadership piece uh, that we want to showcase and, and probably also get some questions uh, from, from your side. Now, uh, trying also to make this, uh, this quite interactive because we are continuously, and by the way, my title has, you know, thought leadership in my title when, uh, when you look at uh, uh, the signature. So, we try also to wonder what thought leadership really means. And uh, and perhaps also you can just unmute yourself. I won't be able to see your hands up, but can I ask you what you think is thought leadership? How does it look like? What is it? Can I can I get maybe from colleagues some ideas? Please come in, unmute yourself. So I can maybe start by saying, I'm 
initiative. Um, yeah. And we can. Like Anybody has an idea of what the leadership is, because we do use this word quite extensively in the organization, right? So. And there's no right or wrong. I mean, I I didn't Google the, the, the definition I'm going to show you. It's what I think from experience thought leadership is. Anybody has, has any idea? Hi, maybe from my side. Um, I think I think it's not um, it's not just knowledge products, which is more for me the thought side. You know, the, doing the thinking and the research, the, it's really the leadership side. So making sure that they're put in formats um, and put in places where they really can be useful and influence um, influence decision making and 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 practice. So, um, yeah, I mean, the really, really probably that emphasis for me is on the leadership side because I think we we do the thought quite well. Over. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Uh, I think George, also you unmuted yourself. Wanted to come in, maybe. That was me. Was it maybe Patrick? Yeah. For, oh, sorry, for, Patrick. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> for, for me, it's bringing something new to the table, so something that's going to cut through um, with our key audiences. So it says something new uh, is based on um, uh, on on new information, new data, new research, and and has a has an impact on changing the the mind or cor course correcting uh the the policies of our our key audiences so um those would be you know governments donors and then across the un and uh ngo communities thank you thank you patrick i fully agree with this actually you will see in in the slides uh, i like you know the the element from george about the action, right? It's not just about thinking and delivering and producing products, knowledge products, but it's also the relevance and whether they produce any outcome, any change. So when I was putting together the presentation, I was thinking, and by the way, I thought leadership is exercised both by an organization or by an individual, right? Depending where, where you want to look at example, but primarily it's also about the person or the organization be considered a trusted source of knowledge. So the element of trust is really important. Um, an authority, we hear this so many times. Oh, that person is an authority, that organization is an authority on, on something on a topic. And that drives also citations, media reports, uh, influencing policy debates. But this is the third element that I think both Patrick and, 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 and George, I think mentioned about the ability to influence and change. So shape, mindsets, so how people, how we think, how we look at things. It's not really doing new things, but maybe doing things differently, very much so. So changing behaviors and practices. So that is really an important element, uh, whether also these knowledge products are impactful and make really a dent into, into policy debates, into practices, etc. And uh, knowledge products are more a channel for thought leadership, right, the vehicle. And uh, now looking and zooming in more into UNDP way of looking at thought leadership and knowledge products, we do have, especially uh, with the focus now on the crisis bureau, internal facing products, which are internal notes, policy briefs, position papers, um, how to guide, guidance note, lessons learned, working papers. And these are more produced for the benefit of the organization primarily but not necessarily only for the organization, but we do write guidance note to tell, for example, our, our colleagues how to implement and I don't know, support insider mediation, how to also um, um, uh, guide our colleagues when there is a military coup and constitutional changes of government, how to promote resilience, how to deliver uh, programs that are portfolio uh, oriented. So these are really internal looking, but they do also exercise, I think, thought leadership because you help country offices to change your practice and be more innovative. And then there's another more outreach, advocacy, and external facing type of thought leadership, which is what in the case of UNDP, it revolves around publications, reports, but also opinion pieces, how many times our administrator or even our colleagues are writing op-eds on very important media outlets, blogs, there's a more you know, push from our colleagues in various using blogs. Um, 
maybe as a way to launch a longer publication, right? So and podcasts also, we have more and more to use the podcast, even within the UN as a way also to exercise um, uh, thought leadership. Now, when it comes to examples in UNDP, and this is a mix of um, different products that have been produced around issues of crisis and fragility. Uh, on the left hand side, you find the Human Development Report, which is, I think, maybe the number one knowledge product that is referred, is cited, is really makes UNDP the authority on human development. And um, every year, does uh, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, but also more locally for those of us who've been in country offices, we know that the launch of the Human Development Report is a very highly expected event uh, at the country office. We invite you know, prime ministers and ministers. It's also a way to engage and have a conversation on development space and development issues. On the right side, for example, you'll see the Afghanistan socioeconomic outlook. This was an incredibly important element of position UNDP after the takeover in 2021 by the Taliban. And UNDP, what they did was two months after the change of government, they released this report that was looking at the impact of the change of government on human development. And they, for example, were really highly cited uh, because they expect 97% of the population to possibly fall into poverty. And there was really uh, a great way to exercise thought leadership in a very difficult environment. Other examples are the Soldiers and Citizens report that RBA produced um, last year in 2023, looking at military coups based on 6,000 um, uh, opinion polls, a lot of interviews. This really all grounded on evidence and they received a lot of visibility, a lot of citations. Um, and also the journey to extremism in Africa, looking at prevention of violent extremism, uh, produced again with colleagues working in Africa. Again, a lot of visibility, a lot of also involvement and engagement with the local authorities and government in promoting uh, um, prevention of violent extremism. And finally, the center of the, of the screen, you have the UNDP crisis offer uh, released in 2022. This was a way to tell the external audience what we do um, in crisis and fragility in UNDP and provided both a framework, which is a semi policy framework, but also a kind of a really concrete example of the offer the UNDP puts on the table when there is a crisis and, and there is you know, a situation that warrants UNDP to step in to preserve development. So these were examples of you know, flagship reports that were more external facing. This slide is showing more the internal facing products. Now, I do think they're really equally important because they do shape and they do influence a lot of the conversations. For example, on the left side of the screen, you have a 2016 guidance note on constitution making support. This is still highly referred both in UNDP when we support constitutional reviews, constitutional reforms, but also shaped a lot of conversations among partners uh, working on constitutional uh, reviews. The same also on uh, risking for development, building resilience. These are all signatures, production by UNDP that started to look more internally, but eventually also have uh, a sort of outreach and a scope that goes beyond UNDP. So in terms of knowledge products, why and what really makes them thought leadership examples? And we heard already before, it's the quality of contents and writing. They need to be really well written. The content has to be also based on evidence. And this is the purpose of this session today and how we do it will be explained in a second. Uh, bring a new insight, I think was George mentioning or, or, P, or Patrick saying the innovation element that we bring in new insights. Sometimes new insights are brought by the same data we've been using in the past, but maybe by uh, looking at correlations and bring a new understanding of, of, of the same topic from a different angle. The credibility of the institution now, if you, if you look, for example, uh, UNDP has been really developing and publishing human development reports for a really long time. And so that has really beefed up the credibility of the report in itself. Recently, um, the Institute of Economic and Peace has published for the 16 year in a row the Global Peace Index. So those publications become a recurrent um, uh, publication and presence of those institutions. And people do expect their own launch every year. And finally, the relevance. Uh, there's an audience that really needs and refers to these publications and find them useful because they do uh, enable their own work. 
Now coming to the crisis bureau, how we ensure quality. So we started with having um, a bit of an ad hoc process. Uh, about a year ago, uh, we started to systematize the production of knowledge products. And uh, we also launched eventually uh, standard operating procedures or business operations um, guidelines. And so uh, in, in my function, I do implement and coordinate the SOPs. And so I do help all colleagues in the crisis bureau when they want to develop a new knowledge product. And um, and this is trying to systematize because in the past it was a bit, of, as I said, an ad hoc process. And also there's been a duplication and multiplication of many guidance nodes and, and different products. So we want to make sure that relevance and avoiding duplication is all in there. So the guidance provides support in how you design a really compelling knowledge product, um, how we provide guidance and, and advice on how to run a consultation. We always emphasize linking back to what the country offices are doing, especially those working in crisis and fragile settings. Uh, we always recommend peer review. For example, at the moment, we are supporting a, a practice note on a constitutional change of the government here in the crisis bureau. So we have created a reference group. And this is a group of experts across bureaus that we nominate and we ask them to review and provide comments to early drafts. And then we also have an approval mechanism that goes from our policy knowledge and partnerships team at the director level and then eventually there's a sign off with all the team leaders in the in, uh, in the crisis bureau and the deputy director in our case to run Saleh is the one approving and, and signing off on knowledge products that doesn't stop with the approval of course the dissemination is equally important so we do always provide um, advice to the authors of these products about how can they best launch and get um, uh, some traction about these knowledge products, um, engaging with the, um, the COPs, the communities of practice, and maybe you know, writing a blog, as I mentioned before, as a way to launch uh, a publication. So different strategies in there, and we always try to help colleagues to get you know, a lot of visibility and outreach. When we also provide uh, support is not just on ongoing knowledge products, but also how we select at the corporate level, we decide what are the best and the most impactful products. And so we have a, ser a series of thematic priorities in the crisis bureau. We also have the crisis offer that I mentioned before that shapes you know, our priorities. But also we incre increasingly trying to ask our own colleagues in the crisis bureau with really thought provoking question about, are you sure that this is something that is needed by the country office? Can you provide evidence that there's been a request by country offices, there is a gap in knowledge, in policy about, or in practice about a topic? And so we try to be quite strict about really this element of the need base uh, for, for knowledge products. And also we try to emphasize the, the thought leadership potential, as, as I said before, is this new product going to change the way we work, the way we operate? There's any uh, visibility in terms of communication, if it's a, a, a acknowledged product that there's also an audience outside UNDP. And eventually collaboration. In the past, we've been doing things in a siloed uh, approach. We're trying also to say, for example, um, you're looking at a knowledge product on women's um, participation in justice, and, and maybe it's the rule of law team that is working on it, but then we try to also uh, entice collaboration with the gender team in BPPS, the gender and crisis facility we have also in UNDP, or when there's a partner outside there, maybe uh, very renowned um, uh, think tanks or research institutions, or even you know donors and member states partners, trying really to maximize the visibility and the collaboration. Now let me pass the floor to, um, to Tania to complete the presentation with one clear example of thought leadership, the development feature series, and then we'll open up for questions after Tania's. Tania, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Fabio, and thanks uh, Karini and Nina and the entire team for um, the opportunity to present. So the development future series is uh, basically um, a, a, a flagship, one of UNDP's flagship knowledge uh, initiatives. It's basically a series of publications of uh, of policy briefs and and working papers focused on the future of development. Um, so when we launched the Development Future Series back in 2020, the idea was to uh, basically create a platform that would um, allow UNDP personnel. 
uh, from the entire organization globally, uh, independently of whether uh, there are staff, you know, consultants, interns, um, to 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 publish, uh, to to publish research, to publish publish work, publish their analysis. Uh, as long as it's uh, evidence based and with a focus on the future of development so under their under their own names um yes and the idea behind that was that this way we would try to you know incentivize um in incentivize knowledge production analysis debate within the organization uh, for people to actually share uh, all of this knowledge and insights that they often have uh, especially at country level um, and in that way, also help, you know, position UNDP in different uh, debates on sustainable development, on the future of development. So on the one hand, incentivizing internally that uh, knowledge production and based on that, helping UNDP position itself as a thought leader um, on different issues uh, on development in all kinds of contexts, also crisis and fragility. Um, and yeah, since since its launch, it's uh, uh, the DFS has kind of established itself now as a as a as a brand of UNDP thought leadership. As several of of the papers uh, have uh, have received quite a lot of uh, interest. There's both interest internally and from UNDP staff to publish through the DFS, but also um, uh, yeah, some some of the papers have uh, gone on to you know shape uh, debates both at global level, but also at country level. And, and the DFS is a um, joint cross-bureau initiative, so both uh, based through the, or managed through the Crisis Bureau and through the Bureau for Policy and Program Support. Yes, next. Um, yeah, so basically um, we, we publish two types of papers. We have uh, our shorter policy briefs, which are, um, targeted to an, a, a broader audience of development practitioners, policymakers at, at large, uh, you know, interested journalists. And then we have our much more detailed, longer uh, working papers, which can be up to you know, 20, 30 pages um, and targeted, you know, a much more uh, specialized audience, could be researchers, academia, et cetera, um, both, but you know, the common the the common characteristics of both types of publication is that we really kind of emphasize uh, the importance of whatever analysis is presented or whatever opinions they really have to be based on evidence um, uh, on research on evidence on data so that's really kind of the 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 main building block of any uh, development future series papers and then uh, very importantly that this is then linked to some, you know, concrete policy implications. So, like, so what? So what for development? Uh, for for whatever policy area the paper is uh, focusing on, and with a strong focus on that that future element, or yeah, the future element, or what is new? Or what are the new insights that we can learn from this specific, uh, from this evidence, uh, from these insights? So that's kind of the the main characteristics of. Uh, of the development future series papers. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as uh, Fabio mentioned earlier, we published over 80 papers or so 84 papers since uh, uh, the launch in 2020. Uh, the large majority are the shorter policy briefs. We've also had 10 working papers published so far. Um, Usually, we uh, try to oh, oh, periodically we launch thematic call for papers, and this is how we uh, usually receive you know proposals for papers. Um, we've increasingly tried to you know uh, make these call for papers more targeted and uh, more relevant, as uh, as uh, Fabio was mentioning before, the importance of of relevance for thought leadership. Uh, so e either linking this to any global event that UNDP is engaged in or um, any, uh, you know, the priorities, for instance, of the organization research-wise or other kinds of priorities. So uh, we've had um, 
I called for papers on gender equality that was feeding into the last uh, gender equality strategy, or I called for papers on SDG push related to the SDG summit last year. So we've increasingly tried to kind of target um, the call for papers. Um, yeah, and uh, and also um, we we've done a lot of work in order to diversify as much as possible the. Um, the, the authorship uh, of of the development future series when we first launched we only received the almost exclusively received proposals for papers from from men at headquarters <laughs> um which is great proposals but obviously then we did um a, a, a more uh, targeted outreach in order to to have more women uh, submit proposals for papers across the organization and also for country offices and regional office uh, colleagues to submit proposals, um, which uh, now has um, now we have a more balanced, uh, I would say, representation of, uh, of authors, even though we still this is still a work in progress. Um, yeah, and some some regions are more have. Yeah, are more represented than others, so it's a work in progress, yes. Uh, so, uh, here are two examples of uh, different papers that have uh, ex ex that have um, you know impacted debates at different levels. So, examples of of thought leadership. Um, on the one hand, on the left, it's a paper published last year on um, on debt and social protection. Uh, so. Uh, analyzing the situation of uh, debt, serve, debt in different developing countries, but then really also coming up with some concrete policy, global policy recommendations. And uh, together with the Bureau of External Relations, this paper was um, you know, uh, distributed, disseminated quite widely, so it received a lot of international media attention uh, and was launched right before a G20 finance um, minister's meeting. So that meant that this paper contributed to kind of framing the debate at the G20 uh, finance minister's meeting. And in that way, uh, yeah, helped UNDP position itself as a thought leader, kind of shaping, you know, the discussions um, at, at global level. And then on the other hand, we have an example of a... Um, uh, at country level, this was a paper uh, published by the Bangladesh uh, country office, by the research facility, the UNDP research facility, uh, basically um, you know, analyzing multidimensional poverty and extracting different insights based on data they had collected from a project. And they presented this paper at different uh, national and regional um, conferences, wrote blogs, uh, and then eventually this led, you know, to further collaboration, uh, programmatic um, and research-wise. So it's another example of how a DFS paper has, uh, at, at that level, at country level, you know, had an impact. It continued the research, uh, you know, at research set a research agenda going forward. Uh, yeah. So two examples of how DFS papers have contributed to position UNDP as a thought leader. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the last thing here is a very um, uh, general uh, overview of how we um, of the drafting and publication process of a DFS paper from the moment we receive a a proposal from colleagues and um, the different steps we do in order to review. Really, it's a it's a feedback loop between the DFS team and the authors. We constantly review different drafts, provide feedback, and very importantly, um, as uh, Fabio was mentioning before, we uh, we really insist on the peer review. So we, we um, contact different colleagues across the organization with expertise in the exact topic that uh, uh, that the paper is about and ask them to review and provide detailed comments. And then we really work with the authors to ensure that these comments or any gaps or concerns are addressed in the paper. And again, this is really to you know ensure that quality that then feeds into what Fabio was saying about the the authority, uh, you know, the quality of the series, um, making it an an authority on this on. The future of development. So it's really important, an important part of the of the drafting and publication process, which then continues editing design, uh, 
dissemination and then uh, tracking the impact of the, of the papers. So yeah, very broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next. And yes, um, if you want to know more about the Development Future series, uh, I would encourage everyone to visit the kind of the repository of all the DFS papers on the UNDP site. So that first link. Um, yeah, you can find everything on there, all the all the papers. If you want to follow, you know, news, any new call for papers or any new papers, you can also visit the Spark Blue page. Um, or the you can also have a look at the YouTube DFS YouTube playlist. There are presentations there, um, recordings where we did more e detailed presentations of the nitty gritty of producing a DFS paper. So if you're interested in that, you can. Uh, you, the, the criteria, what we look for, etc. So you can have a look at that. And yeah, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out the email at the bottom. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank Over to you, Karine. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya and um, Fabio. Um, so yeah, at this time, um, and thank you so much for the presentation um, at this time. Uh, if you have any questions, I see there were some comments on the chat. Um, and if there are any questions or any comments about um, the topic of thought leadership or uh, the processes that were presented, please, colleagues, feel free to come in. Um, and yes, uh, feel free to suggest as well any uh, resources that might be useful. So, okay, Femina with her yes. hand up. Hi, Mina. Hi. maybe yeah. I can just quickly go. Um, Tanya, is there any upcoming DFX um, work that is being done that colleagues should be aware of? Uh, yes, yeah, so we do. Um have some publications in our pipeline uh, for that I would kind of follow on, on different topics. Um, we have a recent publication on uh, the role of, uh, of culture and music industry for crisis and livelihoods, uh, livelihoods recovery in crisis context. So that might be of interest to some of the colleagues in the crisis bureau, but um, uh, we do plan to have a series of uh, discussions uh, leading up to the summit of the future where we uh, will work with different teams across UNDP to present um, you know, some of the research they are working on. So these are not yet published papers, but eventually we hope these will uh, become papers based on, on that research and the discussions that will happen during um, these sessions. So these will be events online. So uh, keep your eyes out for whenever we uh, send out invitations for, for this. It will be done through, you know, email uh, the usual uh, channels. Uh, yeah, so those are the, um, that's the big uh, thing coming up for the Development Future Series currently. Maybe if I can uh, just add something to, to this initiative, Tanya, you're mentioning, uh, there's not a linear process of developing, you know, knowledge products. We, we are trying with these events that Tanya is mentioning now on the Summit of the Future, rather than starting with a paper and then leading maybe to a presentation to do the opposite. You start with a presentation, you bring even, you know, clashing opinions on the same stage. You try also to find areas for collaboration. You bring the audience in, you get a feedback, you see if there is momentum for that topic. And that can lead to a paper later on. So we're trying different strategies instead of going the traditional way. Because sometimes we think, as I said before, that there is really an audience for a topic in a paper. Maybe there isn't. And um, and this is also a way to ascertain and verify there is an, you know, an audience and interest. There's a gap that we want to fill as UNDP, or we want to partner with other you know institutions to do something together. So I do encourage also to try different strategies. I think that's great. Maybe just to say, I mean, UNDP is kind of risk averse, um, and I can, like having conversations that clashes. I, I'll be tuning in for that um, because you know it's not something that we do a lot and like talking about even mistakes or different opinions that's not very it doesn't happen very often but yeah it, it sounds exciting to me it does um thank thank you so much um 
Fabio and Tania. So uh, once again, inviting um, any contributions, colleagues. Um, okay, there's a question um, on scientific papers that have development um, implications. Um, so it's about partnering with a university before a country office can publish. Do we need any clearance? So a question on, on the process there. Um, Fabio or Tania, whoever would like to take that or if we need. Um, yeah, sorry, if you can yeah. ask maybe is it formula, right? So if you're writing on your own personal capacity, uh, I think there's uh, on pop you will find guidance because you need to seek clearance in the country office from the RR. And whereas if this is happening in uh, in headquarters, I think it has to be cleared also with the directorate in your in your bureau. So if you're writing on on your personal capacity, which I do encourage, provided that you know there's also another peer review and there's going to be a political read. Recently, I've been asked to to read the paper that an, a colleague was writing, and so you know you just want to make sure that it doesn't. Um, argue anything compromising on the principles and the values of your organization. It doesn't not expose. And of course, you put all the disclaimers and the caveats in, in a footnote saying this is you know personal views of the author, but still you need the kind of clearance. If it's at the level of the country office and there's a partnership with a research institution, you don't need clearance, but I'm assuming that still the RR might have discussed this with the re relevant regional bureau. Thank you, Fabio. Um, I see some other messages. So um, what I'm gonna do is also share again the link to the to the portal. So colleagues, uh, there you will find more information, but also um, um, about what um, yeah, what the knowledge, uh, how you could classify a knowledge product and the process on the portal. But then, if there are any um, Comments from two Fabio, Wartania, or Nina. Oh, sorry. There's, I didn't yeah, see those. Questions. Sorry. So, um, David, um, please feel free to. Yeah. To Thanks, colleagues. Um, it was very interesting to hear this uh, this presentation. For those who don't know me, I'm David Kudu. I'm the Global Human Mobility Advisor, advisor within the, the Crisis Bureau. I produced myself a development future series. Uh, some time ago, uh, probably one of the first ones. Uh, the the presentation the the was not as fancy as uh, now. Uh, the covers, but anyway, uh, a couple of comments, questions. I think it's important, and you did it to dissociate uh, thought leadership and knowledge products. For instance, I mean, you were mentioning the crisis offer. For me, the crisis offer is a knowledge product. It's not thought leadership. Um, it just the offer, even though there are some thinking about a development approach to crisis, but uh, shouldn't consider that as a thought leadership uh, product. Um, but beyond that, uh, so a couple of, uh, yeah, uh, you insisted, Fabio, on the knowledge products and has to come from demand, demand. But the process of the development futures uh, series looks very supply uh, driven. Uh, it's about uh, calling authors, uh, people suggesting. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure where the demand is uh, on on this. So I'm I'm curious to see how you envision this uh, this demand for the the development future series. Um, as soon as the authors are UNDP, they suggest titles. They think that are good ideas. This is supply driven. This is not demand driven. Um, so that's the first point. The second point on the peer reviews. Uh, so one thing is the peer reviewing process for development future series. You say to colleagues internally, uh, but for the other, Fabio, you said, uh, yes, we are consulting different teams, uh, team leaders, and that I'm a little bit puzzled by that because, I mean, first, my experience uh, in UNDP and four years at headquarters is that colleagues have never have time. So yes, we have a list of peer reviewers, 
And in the best case scenario, they read the executive summary and uh, they provide comments. And the second point is that beyond the question of time, there is the question of uh, capacity and expertise. Uh, I'm sorry, on many topics, uh, I mean, we have technical teams. Beyond that, you have some people who know about some topics, but they are not experts. And, uh, and then that's the question. Peer reviewing should be external. Uh, I worked for 10 years at OECD. You couldn't publish any report without having external reviewers who were experts on the topic based in universities or in other international organizations, but that guarantees some better quality uh, because saying we are guaranteeing quality control through internal peer reviewing, honestly, based on my experience, I'm not sure it works. We tick a box, we consulted, colleagues provided comments. Again, best case scenario, they read the, the executive summary. Uh, I have never received detailed comments from colleagues uh, on a report, uh, reading everything, and uh, some do, uh, but at the team leader uh, level, I would be very curious to see uh, to see that. Um, so I think that also if we are talking about thought leadership and and real peer reviewing, we need to consider the fact that we bring external people, real experts on these topics. And again, it, it should be both. It, of course, we need to have an internal quality control and uh, and 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 going through uh, internal uh, reviewing, but. We need also to have external people. And then the question of impact, I think George put in the comments something very good about the experience and uh, uh, how the, the impact. I don't think that media is enough. It's also how they are used, how they are quoted by external people. Uh, how uh, does it have an impact? Our policymakers, because our audience are policymakers, uh, mostly, uh, are we able through our thought leadership to influence policies. Um, that's a key uh, impact indicator for me. And of course, it's extremely challenging and very difficult, but at least considering beyond the news, beyond the media, uh, beyond the uh, immediate impact, but that's not an impact uh, on the longer term, uh, what is uh, how these products are are used. Uh, it's very easy to do a good communication campaign to have a strong impact during two or three days impact. Uh, but beyond that, what is our impact in terms of policy making or in terms of uh, programming of uh, us of other agencies? So I think these questions, if we are really talking about thought leadership and not just knowledge uh, products should be uh, addressed and I mean considered and, and addressed. Thanks. But still, again, it's good uh, we have these efforts, and uh, it's uh, it, it, uh, we were missing that, so uh, uh, that's great. Thank you, David. Um, uh, Fabio, Tania, would you like to comment on that, or should we? Um, should we maybe we... gather all questions? Yes. Because I think there's a lot of good points from okay. colleagues. Yes, OK. So, um, Yagis, uh, yeah, sorry for mispronouncing. Uh, yes. yes. Hi, colleagues. Thanks a lot for the presentations. It was really helpful to understand a bit more. Um, I have two questions, which are related. First one is, we had some knowledge product commitments that were done before this new process, and also like new ideas we have around it. Some of them are related to donors. They're expecting some republications from us and others are with our partners. So what should we do for those existing commitments? Because we had uh, committed, for example, publishing two reports by the end of the year. And my team, I, I, I should have done this earlier. I work in the rule of law team. My name is Yegis. I work on security sector reform and my team works on human rights, justice, security. So we have many competing areas and sometimes security is priority sometimes it's not and 
but we made these commitments and it really is tied to the money. So that's like my question is how do we go with these ones that we had done so for the future we can think about these. My second question is about smaller things that we would normally not go for knowledge uh, product process like fact sheets, smaller reports, internal reports. Could we still publish them internally? Maybe publish is the wrong word. We would in the past upload them to our website and they were good enough, but of course they still have the UNDP logo, so they come with some kind of accountability. And for those smaller pieces, what should we be doing in the future? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, um, George, um, George May, um, please feel free to come in. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm George, um, based in Bangkok um, in the Recovery Solutions Human Mobility team. Uh, yeah, I mean, firstly, I think I just second what, what David said around, you know, um, I'd be interested to hear what um, what colleagues have spoken today feel UNDP's role should be in kind of knowledge production, because having come from the academic background, I mean, there's very much a perception that we sit in the grey literature space, and this relates to some of these issues around the, the rigour of peer review. It relates to some of the issues also around, you know, the whether we have ethics ethics reviews as part of our as part of our research production and lots of these stages in knowledge production that you get within academic institutions that don't exist in, in UNDP. Now I don't I I think we you know that gives us agility maybe that that um that there isn't in the academic space. It takes a very long time to do anything. Um but I'd be interested to hear what colleagues think um think think about this. But then the the question really is um I was wondering if if um, you'd be able to share any examples of like really innovative ways of presenting um, presenting knowledge um, presenting the the knowledge and doing thought leadership. But when when we were doing this this report that actually became a DFS um, brief, um, we had talked about the potentially of doing like a little clickable game even because we're constantly being pushed to find ways to pack things into very short packages that are easily digested. And I think, you know, we do that quite well with short reports and videos, but um, I'm wondering if, if if there are examples of of, of other ways of, of presenting, um, presenting the sorts of knowledge that we generate, I guess, um, aside from just PDF documents that are attached to emails um, and videos on YouTube um, over. Maybe Tanya and I, we can start addressing some of these. I don't know, Tanya, you want to start? Uh, yes, I can. Um, yes, um, maybe on the question of the, uh, demand and supply, yes. Um, it, it's true that many of the DFS papers are kind of a bottom-up process it's the it's colleagues uh, around the world that reach out to us um, with an idea of a paper uh, but but there is at the same time uh, a, a DFS team <laughs> that does um, I mean we do, we do a selection let's say and we, we do have apply some criteria that we think are relevant so in that sense it's not everything under the sun that that is published necessarily. And then what I was mentioning during the um, during the presentation that uh, I mean we we are conscious of the need to continue continually in, you know increase improve the relevance um, of the DFS papers, which is why we are working on targeting you know increasingly uh, uh, of putting together call for papers that are uh, you know more focused, more targeted, where we do. Uh, a better or better or uh, yeah a, another kind of curation let's say of the papers that are that are published so in that way it, it is a balance between uh, um yeah tr that demand which is the dfs team in collaboration with thematic teams or uh, you know uh, or or teams that are have you know more strategic policy uh, role so Fabio's team, for instance, in um, in, in the crisis bureau, which has that uh, that role of policy, uh, uh, yeah, thought leadership, but kind of from a policy overall perspective. So engaging, so it's not, um, yeah. So so it becomes that kind of back and forth <laughs> dialogue. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, on the peer review, yes, it, it would in it would be great. <laughs> 
if we if we could uh, have um have the resources basically to also uh you know engage in that uh, in uh, systematically having external peer reviews in some of the papers we do have uh, external peer reviews but um uh, but obviously not on all uh, our standard is that we have to have at least uh, you know internal peer review but but we do um, insist on this these reviews at least for the development future series uh, to to be in depth and detailed and uh, if we don't get this uh, uh, detailed comments uh, we will reach, find other other colleagues that are able to to provide them and then yeah so so we are aware that. Uh, Ideally, uh, we would like to have, you know, a, a, a broader, uh, a broader selection of peer reviewers, external as well. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, we, we do have also limitations, and and I think the the DFS also does not uh, currently, or we don't aspire to be, you know, an academic. We're, we're not a journal, uh, you know, uh, a scientific journal. We are, uh, you know. Uh, this in between uh, kind of publication platform that is for UNDP staff, uh, but um, but yeah, but but where we do you know try to put forward evidence and and do man try to maintain that kind of level of quality. Um, yeah, uh, da, da, da. yeah. Maybe Fabio, you have other things. That I'll uh, see if there were some of the other questions that I can. Thanks. You left uh, the tough questions from from David. Let me uh, thank you, David. And you and I, I think, had already a few exchanges on this, and uh, it, it's really interesting to get you know this feedback. So let me start from what you know, Krishanti, Chris, she put in in the chat, right? So we we don't have yet a publication team, unlike other agencies or other institutions, we don't have yet even a research agenda. So there will be for the Crisis Bureau or for UNDP on crisis work, there will be. Next year, we're working on it, but we are starting from scratch. There's no really protocols, guidance, and it's not something that I think we've really been investing systematically in the past, but we are starting now. And so um, some of the, the my answer will be just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, half baked answers. So excuse uh, for uh, for that. Uh, but in terms of um, the need-based elements, so just a caveat, so the DFS is a very specific and one type of knowledge products, right? And But there's also many different ones where we do encourage and we want to see the need-based element uh, reinforced. So if you're writing a guidance note on how to implement peace building programming, we want to make sure that we already have four or five of those. Is it new? Is it coming from a demand that what we have is not you know, accurate and does not really provide a, a comprehensive support to country office to implement programs in peace building? So if that is the so we question why we need to produce something at the very start. Um, but also in the case of DFS, there is a little bit of a needs um, way to address needs. For example, there is a paper that's been going on now for a while on anti-racism and development. They will really encourage, and this is coming from the, um, uh, the the kind of informal group that started during uh, COVID, when the Black Lives Matter movement started to take root in the U.S. and that created a wave of emotions and commitment in UNDP, and a lot of colleagues started these conversations, and they've been writing a paper which is extremely consultative and reflects a need in the organization. I think that is a beautiful example of filling a gap and also enticing, you know, looking at the need base. Uh, for the crisis software, David, um, I was very surprised positively that some of the donors, and this is from Vera, donors love the crisis software because for them it's a simple way to organize what UNDP does in crisis. We all have our own, you know, ways of looking at it as an imperfect document, but however, sometimes these documents are not developed to make us happy as UNDP personnel, but they have maybe an audience which needs a simplified, you know, a, a characterized a summary of what we do. So to some extent, sometimes there is an expected, you know, e you know, impact of this, uh, of these products. Now, the most important question is about the peer review. So uh, some of the papers in the FS are actually written. I wrote a paper with an academic. And so we also asked, you know, uh, peer review process internal and outside. Um, 
some of the internal UNDP knowledge product, uh, they cannot really have an external review. Again, the example I'm working on this guidance practice note on military coups. We are not able because of the sensitivity of the topic to go and have an external review. So what we're doing is to have a really large reference group. And I hear you, David, on the frustration that not many people comment on that. But we're trying to create momentum and design a consultation where we we give the heads up to people. We tell them this is a really important piece for positioning and working in extremely difficult context in UNDP. We we try to create entice really and say, we're going to send you this, please, your comments are really important. But also we go through the bureaus and we say, can you nominate officially a representative to review this process? So if there is a nomination, that puts the individual that's been nominated also with an accountability responsibility to provide you comments. I know that I'm giving you imperfect answers, but we definitely can help you also in, in our role to design peer review processes that are effective and meaningful and help you have really compelling knowledge products. So do rely on us for that. And, um, and finally, uh, an example, uh, I think George mentioned a good example of uh, how we present. So soldiers and citizens report written by uh, the Regional Bureau for Africa. Use the microsite. Now, comms colleagues, they don't really encourage microsites because they divert traffic elsewhere and not on the UNDP website. But in some cases, those are justified. So in the case of the soldiers and citizens, they used the type of, you know, scroll down, a lot of infographics, a lot of visuals, key messages, um, clickable tweets on the microsite, which I thought was effective. Now, funny enough, I just went to look for that website right now. I think they didn't pay for <laughs> the cost of the website, so it's no longer active. So a reminder, I think about also, we should keep, you know, an eye on, uh, on those microsites and keep on, on paying for the rights to keep the, the URL active. But there's multiple examples, I think. There's also digital guides in UNDP that I do encourage not to be obsessed only to put out guidance note because sometimes we're really, you know, crowding the space, but digital guides, very interactive, can be also as effective, even more effective than papers that we write. Uh, Yagi's on partnerships. Sometimes yeah, we understand that we try to address partnerships so when a donor asks UNDP to develop a knowledge product, we understand that there's a requirement and there's a, you know, a financial commitment and better. So we try to be flexible and but provided also that the quality we don't compromise on quality right that's the most important part i think but um i take it maybe too much time thank you colleagues and uh, honestly we can organize other sessions on these and uh, and we need your feedback on improving our work so please you know to to continue and the chat will be active we'll be happy to respond later Yes, thank, thank you so much, uh, Fabio and Tanya, and thanks to our colleagues also for keeping the conversation um, going on the chat box. And yes, as Fabio just said, um, the space will be, um, it's still available if you want to keep exchanging on that. And we can um, brainstorm other sessions as well. So this is super useful. Um, I'm sharing here now uh the list of uh previous sessions for your reference if you want to check any of the previous recordings um if you have any uh difficulties accessing those we'll have also the recording from today's session so yeah thank you so much um i don't know uh, nina fabio tanya do you have any comments uh before we close um Maybe just, just a thank keep you. On, okay. Keep on doing this. Keep on doing these sessions. I think there's a really yeah, need for people. Say, thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, from our side as well for Fabio and Tanya um, for this. It's really great to have this kind of sessions. And also just ask, like, please reach out to us if you uh, come up with other things that we could discuss. We have in in plans for having the graph for thought, which is uh, something that uh, the LAC region did, um, a session with HDRO as well in terms of their processes. But if there's anything else, please do post or share with me or Karini um, separately, and we would uh, love to host more sessions. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay, Thank so you. have colleagues Bye. have a nice rest of day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank colleagues. Bye. Bye-bye.